12. No, I'm not going to sing. I just, I... Romans chapter 12, let's begin with verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us uh, prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or the he that teacheth on teaching. We'll stop for just a moment. Uh, you know, it's a grace that when any one of us, and we've all, the Bible says, have been received a gift from God, that the gift is a divine enablement that the Holy Spirit gives us to make us a blessing to the rest of the church, to make us profitable to the kingdom of God. And uh, we've each one be given some kind of a gift. And there's a number of different kinds of gifts mentioned in the Bible. And uh, one of the early gifts uh, was the gift of prophecy. And I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And uh, we call this, you know, this is called many times the love chapter in the Bible. And uh, it describes love in so many different ways. And I want you to look at it uh, in verse 7. Love, he says, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity, or love, never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Now abide of faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, obviously, what he's talking about here, if you compare this last verse, and now abideth, he's talking about what will abide throughout this church age, through all this time in which we're living right now. But he said, uh, now abideth faith, hope, and charity. And he's not talking about heaven, because in heaven, we don't need faith. Faith will become sight, and there'll be no faith in heaven, and uh, there won't be any hope. Because hope will be fulfilled in complete detail when you get to heaven. But there will be charity. It's going to last forever and ever. And so he says throughout this church age, we will have faith and hope. But some things are going to pass away. And what things are going to pass away? Well, he mentions them here. He said, uh, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Well, when did those things ever vanish away? Well, when that which is perfect was come. And what is he talking about, that which is perfect? He's talking about the completed Bible. When the Bible was completed, then that which is perfect is given to us. We have the Word of God. And so, since we have the Word, we don't need any more prophecy. Why? Because if anybody adds to the words of the prophecy of this book, God adds to him the plagues that are written in the book. We don't need any more prophecy because we have the written Word of God. And the tongues, we don't need the ability to speak in these foreign languages because we have the Bible that can be translated into every language. So the tongue ceased. And what else? A special knowledge. This word knowledge here. Uh, God gave them, before they had the Bible, God gave some of them great ability, great knowledge that they could impart. But once the Bible was given, preachers were told to preach the Word. Not preach our ideas not preach our own opinions, but preach what saith the Lord. So when that which is perfect is come, the word of God was complete, then those things were done away, but faith, hope, and charity remained. And they will remain throughout the church age. Now he said uh, in the church's infancy, uh, there was uh, like a child. And when I was a child, I spake as a child, thought as a child, behaved as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And when the church in its infancy had those things, the gifts of prophecy and, and tongues and, and special divine appointed knowledge, but that was childishness because when that was done away, when that which was perfect was given us. And there is no other interpretation of that that makes any sense whatsoever. You just have to look at it and realize 
that in heaven you don't need faith, you don't need hope. Those things remain. The things that passed away were the prophecies, special tongues, and special knowledge because they were the infancy, things for the infancy of the church. Now that we've become a full-grown church, we have a written Bible. We don't need those childish things anymore. I think that's pretty clear for anybody that believes the book instead of believing what Grandma taught. And uh, we have to come to this book for all of our doctrine. And somebody say, Amen. Amen. Yes, the book will straighten out a whole lot of false teaching if people just get into it and believe it and hold to it. All right, now let's go back to Romans chapter 12. So he said, we are one body in Christ. Everybody who's been saved, baptized by the Holy Spirit. And he said, we're all baptized by the same Spirit into this one body. We've been immersed into Christ. And, uh, and so we're members one of another. And every person who's saved is in this body. Christ is the head of the body. Uh, and the church is the body. And every member is in the body the same way. We were all baptized by the Spirit into the body. Otherwise, we weren't in the body. The only way you can get in is by baptism of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit immerses you into the body of Christ. As we read last week in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 13, it says we are all baptized by one Spirit in this one body. And that means we're members one of another. And that uh, every one of us had different members in our body, uh, but we're members one of another. In the church, Everyone is a member of everyone else who's in the true church. We are members one of another. And what does that mean? I don't think anybody in his right mind would take a hammer and take his uh, finger down there and start beating on his finger. Not if he's in his right mind. That's your part of your body. You're not going to, you're not going to deliberately hurt your own body, right? And yet I see some people in a church attacked other members of the church and say mean things about them or, and, and despise them. And, and, and we're members one of another. Amen. You're hurting your own body when you do that. And, and by the way, you know, when Paul, or at that time he's known as Saul of Tarsus, when he was on the road to Damascus, Jesus uh, spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who was Paul persecuting? Christians. And Jesus said, I'm the head. These people are my body. And when you crucify or, or perse persecute them, they're perse persecuting me. Amen. Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus takes it very seriously with his people. We're members of his body. And so we ought to be very careful with how we treat each other. And like I said, only spiritually insane people would attack other people of their own body. And, uh, and we've got to be careful how we treat one another in the Lord. And the scripture said, the outside world knows us. How is that? By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you love one another. And love means we care about one another. We reach out and try to minister to one to another. Try to be a blessing to those around us. It's our responsibility to be a blessing. And, uh, and we can't close our eyes to the needs of our brothers and sisters because we're members one of another. And so then he said, uh, on ministry, let's wait on our ministry. And preachers uh, need to wait on God and get the message from the Lord so that the message will be the message that God knows the people need to hear. He that teacheth on his teaching. You don't just pick up the Bible and start teaching. You prepare and seek the Lord and get a preparation before you open the Word of God. Or he that exhort, exhorteth on exhortation. Now, exhorting means to really apply the truth with a little more force. It's like, uh, you know, you can teach, uh, thou shalt not steal. But when you're exhorting, you say, now listen, you better not ever take anything that doesn't belong to you, mister. <laughs> well, that's a little more like exhortation. And is trying to encourage people to really fulfill what they already know. And so he that exhorteth waits on his exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. You know, he, what he's doing here is the first two verses uh, covers our relationship with the Lord. And you know, Jesus said all of the law is fulfilled in two things. 
Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. And the second is like unto it, he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now those two things, Jesus said, uh, constitute the whole law. Everything in the law is written to do those two things. Uh, for us to love God, honor God, worship God, serve the Lord, and be a ministering to one another and uh, to be a blessing to love our neighbors yourself. Now, that doesn't mean you love yourself. It means you treat that neighbor like you want to be treated yourself. That's the literal meaning there. The Bible never teaches worship of self. That business, that's some modern psychology says to worship yourself. Jesus said, deny yourself and pick up the cross and follow me. And that's a, quite a different teaching entirely. And don't be careful about loving yourself. But uh, you love and treat everybody like you want to be treated yourself. That's the teaching of the scripture. Now watch what he said. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Now, you know what he's actually saying here is you give it with generosity and with plainness, with openness. But the idea is you don't put any attachment on it when you give it. Uh, so many times uh, people will say, I, I gave so much, uh, they, they ought to listen to what I say. No, no, you, you know, you, when you put it in that offer plate, it belongs to the Lord. You give it, it's His. And we give it with simplicity. We give it and say, Lord, this is yours. Use it for high, your highest glory. And we don't try to go back then and say, well, listen, I gave a lot, so all you got to listen to me how, I, how that money spent. You know, <laughs> it's just not the way it works. Uh, and a treasurer, a treasurer has only one responsibility, and that is to write the checks that the church has authorized to be spent. And that's why we have a budget. And, uh, and a treasurer doesn't have a right to say, you know what I think? I think that uh, we ought to go ahead and paint that side of the building. I'll call up a contractor and get it done. The money's in the bank. He doesn't have that authority to do that. The treasurer doesn't decide how it's spent. The church decides how it's spent. And that's why we have a budget. And that's why we do it. When we have our missions budget, the missions uh, treasurer doesn't have the right to say, you know what? I heard of a missionary over in uh, Australia that I think you ought to have a lot of money and write a check and send it over there. No, no, no. The money is spent according to how the church has voted to support missions. And uh, our treasurer does a wonderful job, counts every penny, and does a great job doing it. And the same thing is true with the building fund. It's the Lord's money. It's not the building uh, chairman's uh, money. He takes care of it. He treasures it. But, uh, and, and he has the right to meet needs, and that's what it's for. But he can't decide, you know what? I need new tires on my car, and we've got some money here. So I just think, well, no, no, no. It's the Lord's money. And so when we give, we give it and we say, Lord, this is yours. We ask you to help us to spend it wisely and stretch it as far as it can go for the glory of God. And so we do that. And that's why we keep very close uh, attention here with, with how the money is spent and how we're doing things. And so he said, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. Now, the ruler is here one that is over the church. And, uh, and there's some verses about that. Uh, if you'll turn there, Brother Terry, uh, and, uh, and give us Acts 20, 28. Yeah, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. That is uh, a pastor's responsibility. He's not in it for money. Uh, he's not doing it because he has to of constraint, but willingly because he feels that he's been called of God and God put him into that place. And so he has responsibility to the Lord. And so he has to feed the flock. Now, first Peter says, feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. You know, that is, he has the responsibility of the, of the church and that's his job. And, uh, and he answers to the Lord for everything that goes on in the church. Uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody to be a pastor unless he's called of God to do it. That's a reality. Uh, I, I think uh, maybe it was D.L. Moody who said years ago, uh, don't pastor a church 
if you can do anything else and be happy. And, uh, you know, you, if when a person's called of God and he gives his life to the Lord, then he's not going to be happy to do anything else except doing what God told him to do. And, uh, and I can t- testify to that. I've always been very happy about where the Lord sent me. Uh, it's his business, and I'm his servant, and he's just made me happy everywhere I've gone. Just keep preaching the book, you know, and God honors the book. And, and that's what we do. But uh, we don't do it because we have to, but uh, we do it because we're called of God to do it. Now watch this. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to the flock, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. And that word again there, it means to watch over the flock, make sure the doctrine is sound, make sure people believe the Word of God and guide their lives by the Word of God and prayer and seeking the Lord and walking with the Lord. And so it's a heavy responsibility, but we gladly do it because we're called of God to do it. And um, so do it, uh, and uh, when you rule, do it with diligence. The word diligence there means uh, give it your whole heart. Uh, It means do it with your whole heart. I heard a preacher one time say, uh, well, I'm only in the ministry because God forced me to be in the ministry. If I could do anything else, the Lord wouldn't let me do anything else, so I'm just doing it because he makes me do it. My advice to him would have been get out. (laughs) You had no business being in there, (laughs) you know. Uh, But you you do it not of constraint, but willingly because you want to do it. And, uh, and you realize that it's a heavy responsibility. Uh, the, the pastor is responsible for the music, responsible for the Bible teaching. He's responsible for the activities. He's the overseer of the whole flock. And the Bible doesn't say, well, you just do this little bit here and uh, let the rest take care of itself. The pastor's overseer. And, and that's a heavy responsibility because you realize you're responsible for the Sunday school or Bible teaching and over missions and over all the rest of it. And, and he has to take that oversight and do it willingly. Now he said, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. It's a great thing to show mercy. That word means to reach out to people and commiserate with people's misery. If somebody is miserable, you enter into that with them. It's more than sympathy. It's more like empathy. You, when someone uh, is hurting, you hurt. And, uh, and that's what he says later uh, on down in verse, uh, f- uh, verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. In other words, be rejoicing with those that are rejoicing and weep with those that are weeping. That's the heart that a pastor has to have and the people have to have one for another. And uh, don't show mercy and give to somebody and try to help them and begrudge it. Don't do it grudgingly. Do it because you want to do it, because God puts it in your heart to be a blessing. And you want to be a blessing to people. You want to reach out to people. You want your life to count. You want your life to be a blessing to those around you. You want to just keep on, keep it on. Now notice what he says. Let love be without dissimulation. That word dissimulation, is, it means hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite about it. You know, uh, I had a fellow one time I met that uh, I, I just kind of knew that uh, he didn't appreciate my preaching and teaching. And, but he walked to me one time and said, Brother, I just love you. And I'd only met him one time. And I said, Brother, how can you love me? You don't even know me. Well, that was a little smart, maybe. But I've tried to put him in his place in a nice way. But I think, you know, we can be hypocritical about even loving people. We can say, I love you, and not do anything to show that. Let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And if some, you see someone have a need and you say, God bless you, they can't eat a God bless you. And so we need to put shoe leather on our love and reach out and be a blessing to those around us. I think our church here does a wonderful job of doing that. Uh, anyone who's sick, they descend and take food in and try to help everybody and be a blessing to everybody. And uh, you all know who I'm talking about. All of you have done that. And uh, it's just been, you've reached out. And when someone has a need, you're there to meet that need. And you don't do it grudgingly. You do it because you want to. 
Over in uh, 2 Corinthians, he talks about this giving, and he said, God loves a cheerful giver. And uh, that's what he's teaching here in the same way. And he said, uh, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. God's people in this generation overall have not come to the place they hate sin like they ought to. I'm talking about the, the general churches all across the world. I, I know that's true because they don't make a stand against sin. They don't stand up for what's right. They don't stand against sin. And uh, the scriptures tell us to abhor. That is to detest, to hate sin. And uh, we all know that we've made a good, strong stand against abortion, the murder of the unborn. But how many churches fail to even mention it at all? And, and we were against the sins of sodomy and all of that. And uh, how many people just don't want to mention it at all? Now, there's a fellow down in uh, Texas that's uh, got a big, broad smile. And, uh, and he was inter uh, interviewed on TV. And they said, well, what do you, why don't you preach against sin? He said, well, I don't want to offend anybody. And so he said, I don't mention sin at all. And he said, uh, that the interviewer said, well, some preachers talk about the hell after life. What do you think about that? He said, I don't talk about hell. I, I don't even I don't mention that at all. In my, none of my sermons mention sin or hell or anything to make people unhappy or uncomfortable. Now, that preacher's not of God, period. You, you, you've got to stand and abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. This is a great word. This word cleave here, you love this word. It, it comes from the word that means glue. That's, that's the word. And he said, get glued to what's good. I mean, just get to it. It's, Jesus used the same word when he said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. I may be glued to her. You, know? you two become one. And he said, for Christians, we ought to be so glued to good that we abhor that which is evil. Amen. That is the teaching of the Scripture. Jesus taught the same thing. Paul taught it. Peter taught it. And it's the tenor of the whole Bible. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And uh, you abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good and just make a good stand for the Lord. And then he said, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. That, that sounds like a lot of repetition there. Kindly affectioned. Uh, that's the, the word uh, there, phileo stego. Uh, stego. It means uh, the same kind of love that uh, husband and wives have one for another. Where they become one. And he said, in the church, we ought to have that kind of love one for another. As a devoted husband or a devoted wife, uh, you love each other, they're faithful to each other. We ought to have that same love for each other in the Lord. Love, real, genuine love and care one for another. This is what the Bible teaches. And uh, the Bible leaves us no option to not love one another. Because love is of God. And he that loveth not, loveth, knoweth not God, because God is love. Amen. Direct quotation. And so watch what he says here. He said, uh, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Now, not only are we to love each other like a devoted husband and wife love each other, but also like brothers and sisters love each other. And what he's saying is, I want to double this over. I want to nail this down for you. The way you're supposed to live is to live in love one to another. This is what we're supposed to do. Love one another. And uh, my, my, my. Uh, it, it's a terrible thing when churches, God's people don't love one another. They really care one for another. You know, it's, it's really, really sad. And, and I hate that worse than anything. I hate to see uh, a disunity among God's people. We need to have a loving community of people loving one another, caring one for another, reaching out to one another. If a brother or sister has a need, meet that need. That's love. That's love in action. And that's what the word charity means, 
love in action. And so he said, in honor, preferring one another. The last part of verse 10. And you know what that means? That means put the other person first. In honor, preferring one another. Uh, it's, uh, I see husbands open a door for their wives and they prefer the wife above themselves. If they open a door and let them go in. Open a car door, that kind of thing. But he's teaching us something here that every one of us, all believers in Christ, we ought to honor others over ourselves. We ought to think of others first. Somebody said joy, you know that J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. And that really is a good acrostic because that's what it takes. Denying self and uh, being uh, willing to be used to benefit others and be a blessing to others. That's what the Lord requires of us. That's what he's saying. Now, I mentioned to you those two things. Uh, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbors yourself. The first two verses of chapter 12 talk about our relationship to God, loving Him, serving Him. And then all the way from uh, verse 3 to verse 21 is talking about how we express this love one to another. And we put this love in shoe leather. We actually go out of our way to be a blessing. And we don't look out for self the way the world teaches. Look out for yourself. Look out for number one. That's contrary to God's teaching. God says, look out for others. See if you can be a blessing to somebody else. Reach out and, uh, and be a blessing. And then he said, not slothful in business. You know what? Slothful, we, we use that. Uh, it comes from the word sloth. You know what a sloth is? That, uh, you know, that animal, so I three toed sloths they crawl up on, and it takes them forever to go anywhere because they look like they're the laziest things on planet Earth. And he uses that word here, and that's, that's the word, sloth. And, and he uses the word, and he said, don't be lazy. Be vigorous about the work of God. In, in your business, especially in the Lord's business, put some of vim and vitality in it. Uh, and uh, as Billy Graham used to say, put some pep in your step. And uh, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be diligent in serving the Lord and not drag our feet in doing it. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. These two things actually go side by side. And, and rather than being lazy, rather than being slothful, we're to be being fervent and give it our best. Uh, the scripture said, what your hand finds to do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. We, we need to, to really put our hearts into the work of God. You know, it really is important. Uh, and um, I, I, I've, I've noticed things, uh, and I noticed this, that we're, we're a lot like this. We like to hang around with each other and spend time together and go out to eat together and all those things. That's a great thing. I mean, we're part of one of, it, of one of another. We're a family. And so we need to reach out to one another and help one another and bless one another and encourage one another and, and meet each other's needs. But at the same time, when he said that, he says, uh, we've got to be fervent in serving the Lord. Whatever he wants us to do, do it with all your heart. Do it with your heart. Not just doing it, but do it with your heart. How, how many of you had kids? Oh, look at those. I must be a couple of hundred kids represented. How many of those kids always did everything you wanted them to do? As soon as you said, do it, did they jump in and say, whoo, man, I get to mow the yard. I get to wash the dishes. I, I get to dry the dishes. I get to vacuum the floors. Wow. Anybody had kids did that? <laughs> One. <laughs> But, you know, uh, the scriptures teach us that's where we ought to be about the Lord's work, to be excited about it. I get to serve the Lord, not I have to serve the Lord, but it's my privilege to serve the Lord. Uh, you know, it, to me, I don't quite understand it, and I'm, I'm no example, but I, I love the Lord's work. And, uh, I, you know, I've, I've been at it for now for over 65 years, and I, but I just still love it just like I did in the beginning. 
I love the preaching of the Word and the teaching of the Word and, and the prayers and visiting. And, and uh, It's what gives life. It, it's what it's all about. This is what we are all about. And let's do it with all our heart. That's what the Scriptures teach us here. Now watch us, what he says. He said, rejoicing in hope. You know, we have hope that lies before us. Our hope uh, is anchored into that which is beyond the veil. And uh, the Lord Jesus himself has entered in as the, as the uh, forerunner for us. And we have hope. We have hope in this life and we hope beyond this life. And so we rejoice in it. Patient in tribulation. Hmm, that was a little harder. When the things go sour and go south and you still become patient and you just take whatever comes your way with determination that nothing's going to knock you out of the race. You're just going to keep on going. You may slow down a little bit, but you're going to keep going. You're going to be patient in tribulation. Well, you know, over in the book of Romans chapter 8, he told us, or chapter 5, he told us, remember, tribulation worketh patience. So we're to be patient in tribulation. And these two play on each other. And so we are learning tribulation worketh patience. And so I've had people say, well, I don't pray for patience because I know what's coming. <laughs> and there might be some truth in that. And so we have to be sure that when we have trouble, we have to be patient and believe that the Lord's going to bring us through it. And uh, you know that, like the fellow said, it came to pass. And this will pass too. And it'll come, it, it, it'll go, we're going to make it through it. We're going to be all right. And so then he said, patient and tribulation continuing instant in prayer. And that is you pray until you get an answer. You just pray without ceasing. And that doesn't mean pray 24 hours. It means pray and keep on praying. Don't give up praying until you get an answer to your prayer. And the biblical way is to keep asking for it until the Lord either answers that or shows you the alternate. One or the other. Follow that. You pray whatever you're praying for. You keep praying for that until the Lord either gives it to you or shows you an alternate. He, then he tells you, I would rather have this, and you pray for that. And that way you pray without ceasing. All right, we'll stop right there, and let's look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you for how it guides us in our lives. And help us to embrace this word, to believe every word in it, and to guide our lives by it. And Lord, help us to walk with you, believing you, trusting you, and putting our whole lives in your hands, and walking with you in Jesus' name. Amen.